All righty. So hi, for those of you who are tuning into the recording, my name is Tom Campbell. I work here at College Essay Guy alongside my lovely colleague, Renee Ferrario, who was laughing just by that own introduction. So I already feel so entertaining. Um, and we're going to be presenting on Beyond the Essays, Five Ways to Stand Out Through the Regular Decision Application Process. Renee, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Yes. And those for those of you who are just tuning in and with our recording button being pushed, my name is Renee Ferrario. I am a senior college counselor at College Essay Guy. I'm also the director of college counseling at the O'Neill School in Southern Pines, North Carolina, and I'm joining Tom tonight uh, for this presentation. So our agenda for tonight, we're talking about regular decision and how your regular decision app can stand out. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about how the regular decision application process should be different than early apps. Some of you may have applied already early early decision, early action, and some of you may just be submitting your first applications now. Either way, all of these tips will come in handy for you. Um, what actually makes a difference in your application process, especially if it's at the last minute? We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about how optional application components um, can help you stand out. And there's, we're going to go through what those are. Uh, demonstrating interest. I and mean, you've probably heard this term before if you've tuned into any CEG podcasts or webinars or presentations. We talk about demonstrated interest a lot. So we're going to talk about how that can um, help you to make an impression with the colleges and what those, those things are that you can do to demonstrate interest. And then we're going to talk a little bit about applicant portals and the importance of, of their role in this entire process. So Tom, I'm going to let you take it away. All right. Thanks, Renee. So some food for thought, we wanted to kind of just start off with and um, a little bit of like a someone I think wrote in the chat like that they're going to take a deep breath on winter break, but we can start a little bit now um, because especially with the college admission process in the United States, there is a lot, unfortunately, of variability from college to college to college. There's no one size fits all approach that like for every school you send in these things or you self report your scores or this or that. So Unfortunately, our answer for a lot of questions that you may start to answer is that it depends on the individual college. Um, but we wanted to kind of just, especially when there's so many headlines about how competitive it is to be admitted to schools, we wanted to take a second to kind of show these three key statistics about the fact that if you are feeling overwhelmed by the college process, that's completely normal and understandable. Um, there are great resources like College Essay Guide to provide you with guidance and support and expertise to help make that a reality. Um, but something that we really wanna stress, especially if you are, are applying to some more of the selective colleges out there. So I typically say these are schools with about less than a 30% acceptance rate, give or take. Um, it's really important to know that the majority of colleges that are out there in the US actually admit most of the applicants who apply. Um, that set that you see on the left side really kind of underscores that. Um, and also it's really easy to get caught up with like, I, I really would love to be admitted at my dream school. Oftentimes for many schools who are high achieving students, um, those tend to be schools like the Ivy League schools, MIT, Stanford, Caltech. And we have lots of guidance and resources on how to apply to those schools because they are ones that often have essay components and writing components, which is a lot of what College Essay Guy works on. Um, but that's not as you can see from this stat, most students, high school students are not going to these institutions. Um, and I know Renee, you know, kind of your, your role as a high school counselor, like, you know, that's this for a fact that like, not everyone is going to these really elite schools that get a lot of airtime in the media. Um, and I'll, another kind of plug on the right side is that, you know, it's three quarters of students in the US about go to public institutions. So, you know, taking a look at your in-state flagship school, the school that's available to you if you are a US student, um, to students in your state and you get proactivity there, there's often less, you know, too, it's cheaper. Um, so we just kind of want to plug that it's not all about these highly selective and highly rejective schools, but we also understand the appeal of these schools in terms of resources and opportunities and financial aid policies that really might align with your goals and values. So um, just a little plug, um, but we'll try to give you as much tips as possible to make you as competitive for those schools if that's a goal that you have. Um, so for those of you who did the poll and said that you haven't applied to a school yet, um, just know that regular decision is the second most common way to apply to colleges in the US. It's actually kind of surprising, I think, um, because oftentimes it's like, oh, well, regular decision is probably the most regular option. Um, but actually, according to some data from the common application, which is how you apply to the majority of colleges and universities in the U.S., 
Um, rolling admission policies are actually the most common um, admission decision available at all member institutions on the Common App. I believe they have about over 800 schools at this point. Um, so um, that's just something to keep in mind. And what it means basically is that um, you usually apply by a, a key deadline. And for the majority of the schools that offer this round, um, you send in your college application around January 1st. It's important for you to be aware of your own individual colleges that you've identified your college list to know what the deadline for that school is because not every school is January 1st. That tends to be the general like range of where those applications are expected by. Sometimes it's January 8th, sometimes it's January 15th, um, whatever it may be. Um, some schools have priority deadlines for like scholarships and special things. So again, depending on your own situation, it's important to keep in mind your own deadlines um, and what those are and how they range from place to place. Um, and a big question that we get a lot of times in terms of like just putting together an application process and plan is how many schools should I apply to? Um, it's a really personal decision um, and you're going to get lots of different answers, even from college counselors, college counseling professionals um, who guide students with this process. I would say if you were to pull the majority of counselors, they'd probably recommend somewhere between eight to 15 colleges total on your college list. Um, if you are skewing more towards that more selective college application process. Um, so actually, <laughs> most students in the U.S. only apply to one school, um, just mathematically. Um, but a lot of students who come to us for support are applying to a broader range of schools because of their goals and aspirations. Um, any route you go is completely fine. It's completely your prerogative. Um, but this is something that I'd say if you have a balanced list of schools that are likely schools where you're likely to be admitted, target schools where it's kind of like, you know, give or take, it's hard to make a complete prediction, but you're pretty much in a sweet spot with their academic profile or reach schools where the majority of students who apply are denied. Um, having a range of kind of those likely target and reach schools on your list is the best way to ensure that you have some exciting college options um, come mid-March when the majority of these regular decision schools release their, um, the re release their decisions. Um, if you are tuning in as an international student who has particularly high financial need, we do support a lot of students um, uh, at College SAGI who have that particular reality. Um, we typically recommend actually applying to more schools if that's something that you are navigating because there are very few colleges in the U.S. that meet full financial need for international students. Um, so the competition is a little stiffer. Um, I mean, it's, it's competitive to begin with at those selective colleges, but I'd say particularly for international students who are looking for lots of um, aid, that's a really big thing to keep in mind. So you may want to apply to even possibly more than 15 schools. Um, but again, we it's everyone's kind of process is a little different. Um, so this kind of is just to show you again some data around um, different admission plans by how selective the school is. Um, so as you can see, the majority of the colleges that are not quite as highly selective offer rolling admission plans. And we'll talk about that in just a second. Um, basically, that's where you send in an application kind of at any point whenever you're ready and you get an admissions decision on a rolling basis. So it's not like, oh, I apply on December 1st. Everyone's going to find out the decision on you know, January 1st. I'm just making these dates up. Rolling decision is they release decisions kind of as they get the applications as they come in. Um, so we'll talk about that and kind of where it can fall into your process um, in just a second. So if you apply to schools through an early decision or an early action plan, know that you're not alone. This is something that's becoming increasingly common in the US college landscape, um, as you can see kind of from this first figure. Um, about almost 900,000 students um, applied to at least one school prior to November 1st um, through the common application. Um, this is an increase of 41% from um, the 2019 to 2020 um, data report. So more and more students are kind of learning um, that you know, the early bird gets the worm is that kind of cliche, cliche phrase. Um, and especially with so many more colleges offering early application plans, opportunities, um, it's a chance to hear back from a school earlier. Many of you actually may be hearing back from some schools you applied early this week or next, um, which I know is a very like anxious, you know, um, anxiety and I'm like doing this thing <laughs> um, time. And um, just know that whatever those decisions are, it does not determine the rest of your future and your rest of your life. Um, and you have the regular decision process that you're working towards to be able to apply to more schools, depending on how those results go, go if you apply it early. And we have a little more content about that in a sec. 
Um, if you if you couldn't and you haven't applied to a college yet, you're not alone either. You know, more than about half the applicants who apply through the common application don't submit applications until regular decision round. So you're not behind, you know, or it's not like it's completely unfeasible for you to be able to apply to college um, at this stage and in, in, in the game. Um, we actually just released a YouTube video that is again included in the slides here and Jasmine will be able to share it in the chat called how to get accepted with an application in like basically less than two weeks. Um, and it's a step-by-step -step plan of action items to complete each day um, to be able to make sure that you're getting things done on time and in a way that's not going to completely <laughs> crush you with the overwhelming weight of what you have to accomplish. So what if you apply to schools through early decision or early action? Um, one thing that I would say is, um, this is kind of like a, a tip just from like financial perspective. Um, if you did apply early to schools and you're still waiting to hear back decisions, say for example, you applied early decision to a college where if you are admitted there, you would agree to actually attend that school and withdraw your other applications. It's that binding decision round or Maybe you apply to some schools you're really excited about that have an early action plan. And what that means is that you just apply earlier and hear back earlier, but you don't have to attend there if you are admitted. You have until typically May 1st to choose if you want to go there. I would probably wait to send in your apps for your regular decision schools, get them ready to go in your common application or on your Google Docs or however you make do your work. But um, unless there's a priority scholarship deadline or, or any kind of real reason, I'd say hold on to those apps until you hear back from your early schools, because if you get into those places, you you have you would have to go maybe like withdraw all your applications and email schools saying like, I no longer want to be considered, um, especially if you applied early decision. But B, especially if you're paying money for these application fees and like all of, all of that, you would kind of be out a lot of money if you end up getting into schools that you know you want to go to. So hold on to the apps and decide whether or not you want to send them in, you know, prior to that deadline, a, a little closer to the deadline. Um, and I'd also say to use your early results to kind of predict how on base you were with your range of likely target and reach schools. Um, so in my work as a college counselor prior um, on the high school side, Oftentimes, I'd have some students who had real high aspirations for where they were sending in their applications. And, you know, we tried to kind of mention to them what we thought was a likely or a target or a reach school based on data from applicants from the high school. We would look at like, okay, you know, who, the, all the kids from Lakeside who applied to Brown, here's the typical academic profile, the typical advanced courses that they took, the typical grades, um, other information that we had about our applicant pool from our particular high school. Um, we would kind of guide them on whether or not the colleges that they were applying to were likely targets and reaches um, based on that information. But um, sometimes the results from early, especially if you were like, oh, all these schools, I, I'm pretty sure I'm going to be admitted to or maybe waitlisted to one or whatnot. And if you do end up, you know, realizing that schools that you thought in your mind were kind of like, you know, a no brainer, if those don't end up working out, it could be an opportunity for you to do a little reflection on whether or not those um, designations on kind of your or organizing your college list were accurate. But I also had the same, this is kind of like conflicting advice in a way. There's also kind of the other end of the spectrum where certain students think, okay, because I didn't get into my early action or early decision school, my application is bad. And there's something about it that's a mistake and that I need to change my approach or what I'm writing about for these different regular decision schools. And that's really not the case. Um, oftentimes when students are not admitted to colleges early, especially if they worked hard on their application, it communicates their skills, qualities, values, and interests. It's complete. Um, it typically has nothing to do with the quality of your application and much more to do with the college's institutional priorities, which are things that are happening behind the scenes that influence why certain students are admitted and not others. Those include things like legacy admission policies, student athletes, students in first generation low income backgrounds, um, uh, students who come from particular states or regions, students who are applying to particular majors might be more attractive to a college than other students. So it really depends on the individual school and colleges are not super transparent all the time with what those priorities look like each individual cycle. We have a whole course on highly selective admissions that talks a lot about this, um, but just want to give you a little bit of like a, you're doing great sweet like cheerleader moment here, because um, even if you don't get into your early schools, 
especially if you apply to more highly selected schools, most students don't get into those schools. Um, I think Brown, for example, just released their decisions today. And we got an email saying that I think it was about 17%, Renee. I'm not sure if you remember the figure who yeah, were admitted. I think four, 14 early. or 17, yeah. 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 And that's, those were all really highly qualified applicants and still the majority of them were turned away. Right. So it's important to remember that and not to get super tripped up on what you sent in with your app, because oftentimes you've done an amazing job with your application. It's just a matter of there being a mismatch in institutional priorities that you don't really have much control over. Um, so with your regular decision schools, really kind of keeping that in mind is a big thing to consider. Right, Tom. So I, I mean, I think that, and I working in schools, I um, I'm with students all day, and the stress levels are high. I've I've had students already who've been um, told no for their early decision schools, and again, like Tom is saying, the majority of the applicant pool is qualified academically, and they they're qualified with all their extracurriculars, and their essays were probably fantastic. But there's really just no way to predict, and there's only a few seats. So going back to one of those first slides, when we talk about the majority of the students, or I'm sorry, the colleges in the country admit 70% plus, we're only talking about a small sliver of schools that everybody in the U.S. and international is trying to get a spot. So that's what makes it so competitive. It's really not a reflection on you. But somehow to ease this stress that you may be in, um, and even whether you've already applied and, and got deferred or denied, or you haven't applied at all yet, and you're now turning to your regular decision um, application, here's a couple of things that you could do to kind of ease a little bit of that stress. So three things, and we'll talk about these in, in a little bit of detail, is we're looking at rolling admissions, looking at colleges that don't have any supplemental essays, and looking at fee waivers or colleges really that don't have any fee ap application fees. So we're going to talk about that. Um, so if you are looking for schools that um, have a rolling admission deadline, or really, it's not really a deadline. Usually the rolling admission is gonna be much later in the year. Now there are some schools that have like a, they might have an early action deadline and then rolling the rest of the year, or they might have a priority deadline for scholarships, but it's rolling. So you still have to get in by a certain point if you wanna be considered for scholarships and things like that. So of course, make sure you're reading the website and the application thoroughly. But for a rolling um, admission application type, once you get in your application and all supplemental docs are there, the school will review the entire application and within a few weeks you should have an answer. So if you could throw a few rolling admission schools or at least one onto your list and get an acceptance early, you don't have to wait until much later in the process when we're talking March, that's a long time to have stress and to have something like in the back of your mind while you're also taking classes and getting ready for AP exams that you're still stressed, knowing that you have a place that you're, you're in. And hopefully this schools are, have already been researched and they're already on your list, but if you have to add one, do a little bit of research, make sure that um, you know this is a school that would be a good fit for you. And then that might be a good option for you to add this school on to see if you can get an acceptance and then you'll, you'll feel that that weight off of your shoulders, like, okay, I'm in, I know I have a place to go, hopefully I'll be admitted to several other schools, but I'm okay with waiting now because I know I have a place to go. So that's one strategy that you can use. Um, the next strategy would probably be, well, also here are some schools that we have that are, that do have rolling admissions that are you've probably heard of. And um, these schools though, even though rolling admissions is a thing at these schools, the earlier the better. So you don't want to wait until you know February or March to get your rolling app in because uh, for for instance, Penn State has 20 different um, different campuses, and the earlier you put your application in, the better chance is that you're going to get the uh, campus that you want. And most students want the main campus, right? So the earlier, the better for that. The other thing with rolling admissions is that the earlier you get your application in the earlier, the, the better chance you have if, it, if it's a school that asks you to apply by major, then the majors can fill up as well. So you want to keep that in mind. But these are six really good, solid, great schools to go to that have rolling admissions. So as long as you can get your docs in, you should hear something back in. Now, I know my, our, many of my students applied right at the beginning of senior year and heard back from Pittsburgh like in two weeks. And then I had another student who heard back from Penn State like a week later. I've also had students already hear back from Arizona State. So 
uh, very, very early if you get your stuff in. So um, the other thing that you can do is um, look at colleges that don't have any supplemental essays. So uh, there, we have a resource here. It's a Forbes uh, article and it lists 80 colleges with no supplemental essays. And I just today or yesterday, I had a student who was denied from their early decision, um, was not upset because I've been talking to my students from basically since junior year saying, if you're gonna apply ED to a very selective school, do it, You know, go for it. We always want you to go for your dream, but have the expectation that you're probably not gonna get in that way. If you get in, you can be happily surprised and have a party. But if you don't get in, you're not going to be, you know, just in desperation because you felt for sure you were going to get in. Um, when the admit rates are in the single digits, you understand that they're denying 90 something percent of the applicant pool. So you need to go in statistically thinking, I'm probably not going to make it. So a student came in, did not get into the early decision pool, wasn't upset because she said, oh, I expected it, which I was proud of her for. And then we talked about this exact thing, um, trying to find a few schools that were also selective because she's an outstanding student, but that don't have um, supplemental essays that she could throw onto her list. And she said, you know, you sent me several schools. I gave her may maybe 10 or 15 to look at. She goes, many of these schools I had already researched and thought about. So I think I'm gonna add a few on. So she's gonna um, look, you know, tomorrow's our last day for winter break. So she's going to have time starting on Saturday to sit down. Everything will be behind her for the semester and she can start looking to see if she may want to add a few of these schools on. Um, and you can also look at some of the essays that you may have already written for some of your early action schools, or maybe if you've been working on some of your regular decision schools already, you may be able to reuse or repurpose some of your supplemental essays um, at, at key in Ethan's super essay. Um, when we talk about things that kind of overlap, topics that overlap that you may be able to use, you may have to tweak it a little bit to fit that school, but hopefully can cut back on some of the writing. Um, so one, one definitely, quick, um, go ahead, Tom, yeah. I was just gonna say one quick thing about the reusing kind of like writing that you have. Um, you know, ideally the point of applying to these colleges with no supplemental essays is you don't have to write a more customized piece of writing for them. It takes time and effort and sometimes you get to a certain point where you've been working on college apps for months you're like you know what i just am done with doing this like i i really just want schools where there it's a more easy apply one thing you can do and it's something that actually the vice president of admissions at um, bates college shared with me is they actually don't require any supplemental essays so they actually are on this next slide here of some schools that you know us on the college essay guy team really you know have had students who have applied to a range of these schools for different reasons um and uh, the admissions uh, director, the VP at Bates, let me know that because they don't have a supplemental essay, they still are really eager to get to know where students come from, their lived experience, their backgrounds. It's something that a lot of colleges have asked this particular year in the application cycle because of changes to the admission process related to the Supreme Court decision on race conscious admissions. We have lots of webinars and resources about that that you can reference if you're curious um, in a YouTube video. Um, but she mentioned to me, she's like, you know, actually, we we would encourage and be very happy to see students in their additional information section, sharing some of those details that they may have included and shared with other colleges. But because we don't require it for access reasons, we don't want to add another barrier to our process. We're not requiring it, but it's something that could definitely be something that we'd love to hear and see from students. So, um, for example, if you happen to have written an essay about your identity or lived experience or your background um, for any other colleges, um, the additional info section could be a great place to kind of modify that essay a little bit and share that with colleges that didn't require it, but would still be eager to learn more about those sides of yourself. Thank you, Tom, because as we were talking about colleges with no supplemental essays, I should have mentioned that I was talking about the additional info section. So thank you for, for fixing that for me. Um, so yes, here are some schools. And again, these are selective schools, excellent schools, but they don't require anything additional. So that should, you know, you, most of these schools will still have the personal statement that's required, but you've already written that. And then, then there should be no supplements that you have to write in the questions part of the Common App. And then you do have the option to use the additional info section. The other thing that you can do is looking at schools that do not have application fees. Um, so yes, it says that you can ask your school counselor or request it through the Common App. But one thing that I found, and I, I was playing around with this earlier, I have like my 
fake student account in the Common App and I went in to play around to see how I could find what's the easiest way to find out schools that don't have an application piece. So there was two ways that I found. The first one was anywhere on the Common App, there's a button that says application requirements. If you click that, it gives you a grid. And in that grid, it tells you what the application fee is for every school. That would be one way to do it, though you would have to scroll through, you know, a thousand schools to do that. The other way to do it is to, if you're on the college search page, there is a little filter and it says like more filters. And if you click on that, there is a little button on the inside that says, schools with no application fees. And when I clicked that button, it showed 580 common app schools that had absolutely no app fee. So if you find a school that has no app fee and has no supplementals, you're golden, right? I mean, you just basically already have your common app done. You don't really have to do anything additional and you don't have to pay anything. And as long as you've researched that school and think it would be a good fit, it might be worth adding that school in um, just to have kind of an, an answer quickly, especially it could be a rolling admission school on top of it. And then you get a, a triple bonus, right? So I don't know if those exist. <laughs> and I, I didn't try to play around with the filter to, to add all three on, but that would be a nice thing to, to look for. Um, and so I think that, um, you know, with these three things, you can definitely have a little bit of relief in this process when you're in regular decision and maybe find out in the next, hopefully by the end of January, you would have an answer if you did, if you did add at least one of these schools into your list. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for that. I think, I think especially like having work with students who get news back, like just having a acceptance like in your back pocket and backpack to be like, you know what, I'm going to college no matter what happens with the rest of these other schools. Um, it's such a huge relief. Yeah, so cannot highly emphasize it enough. Um, and you really have nothing to lose and everything to gain in terms of even just like the emotional benefit. Um, so the second bullet point on our agenda in terms of like the five ways or kind of five things to be thinking about um, when it comes to your uh, regular decision application process. Point number two that we kind of are moving into now with our little purple background, this guy, it's like he's jumping across a chasm. You might not be able to see it in the background, but it's like, what actually is gonna get you to the other side? What are the things that you actually need to be thinking about and concerning yourself with? The whole title of this session is Beyond the Essays because oftentimes, you know, it's really common to go on YouTube or TikTok and see like videos that are like, oh, this is the essay that got me into insert school. Um, and my kind of like little snarky <laughs> retort having read applications for so many years is that you may have been accepted in spite of your essay that could have just been <laughs> meh very fine. Um, it didn't necessarily do you any favors or really kind of make any waves in the admission process, but you were a competitive applicant for all these other reasons and were admitted in spite of a kind of flat, boring essay. That happens every year at a lot of these schools, even the most highly selective ones. Um, so what actually makes a difference in your application? Your essays, of course, do make an impact. We work at College Essay Guy. We definitely think that they can be a really great way to communicate your story. But some of the things we're going to share on this slide here are things that they're on the more pragmatic side, but like Renee and I both can tell you from working with high school students that like these are some of the things that don't always get said or kind of emphasized because so much emphasis is on finely tuning with a comb every word on my application to make it as perfect as possible. When the reality is that most of the admissions officers reading this are going through your files very quickly and they're not dissecting your work and your materials with the same level of scrutiny that you are. Um, so the things to really be focusing on when you are putting together your regular decision process is number one, continue to stay engaged with your classes in school. Um, this seems kind of like a given, but a lot of times students are like, okay, well, my transcript has my ninth through 11th grade grades on it. And I'm really focusing on the here and now with my applications. And oftentimes because there's this new time addition into your, your schedule, it can be really hard to balance your senior classes and performance with your college application cycle. Um, the reason why it's really important not to kind of have your grades really slip is because colleges are expecting to see consistency with your academic performance from what basically like your, your precedent that you've set before from ninth through 11th grade. They wanna see that you've either maintained that same level of academic performance or are surpassing it. What they don't wanna see, and sometimes this happens to many students when they 
put together a senior schedule that is really rigorous, has maybe some more advanced courses than they've taken the previous year. Um, some students will kind of dip in terms of their performance because they're juggling so much with senior year and trying to make it all happen. So as much as possible, try to lean on the supports from your own high school to continue to do well academically. If you do end up slipping and have a, a mid-year you know, grade report um, or a first trimester grade report, whatever your system, the system that your high school uses, um, that it could be an opportunity for you to potentially like inform colleges of something that may have happened. Um, but in general, ideally, you still have some time now to not have your um, grades completely dipped. So just want to put that out there. Also want to plug a podcast that myself and Elena from the score team score is like a, um, if you use Naviance or Maya learning or score, there are ways that a lot of high schools actually help um, students with their application process, sending in documents and things like that. We put together a podcast that's like all about things to do with your senior year. So definitely take a listen to that if you're interested in that particular topic. Okay, and speaking of which, I, thanks yeah. that your high school is spending on your behalf. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I mean, I want to just second what Tom said about the, the mid-year grades. Um, that's something I stress, you know, senioritis is going to set in eventually, probably, hopefully it doesn't, but it seems to always do that but it cannot set in this early because you really need those first semester grades need to be as high as possible, um, especially in the regular decision pool when there may be less spots, more students, it just depends. So you wanna make sure that you look really, really good on paper, um, especially with your grades. Now, some of the other things that I think students forget, and I work at a small school, so I have time to sit down with each one of my students and go through their list and make sure that they understand each one of these points. And sometimes I have to make these points numerous times with the same student. Um, that just happens, right? And because this is new to you guys, we've been doing this, I've been doing this 30 years. This is your first time. So if I tell you something once and you forget, that's totally fine. It doesn't, you know, that's part of my job is to make sure that you guys understand, um, all students understand what they need to do. So the first thing is that if you are going to be sending test scores, because you some some schools, a lot of schools are test optional at this point. So you have the choice of whether you're going to send or not send. Not only do you have the choice of sending or not sending, you also need to look to see how does the school want me to send them. So there is a place on the common app on the main page on the information page for that college where they'll have the test optional policy or test reporting policy. And if you click that link, it should take you directly to the website. The other really easy way to do that is to just Google University of Delaware test optional policy. And somewhere on that page or somewhere you will find um, what their policy is. Are they test optional or not? Hopefully you already know that. And then if you are going to report your scores, how do you report them? If it's self-reported, you put it directly in the common app in the testing section. And you can also turn that button on and off. That's another thing that students don't realize is that if you have, let's say 10 schools in your common app and only wanna send your test scores to let's say four or five of them, on the day that you're submitting for that particular school, you wanna make sure that you've answered, yes, I wanna send test scores and you have your test scores populated. For a school that you don't want to submit, you want to make sure in the testing tab that you say, no, I don't want to submit, and all of the test scores will disappear. And make sure that when you are um, reviewing before you submit, you're going to pull the PDF and you'll review before you submit. Make sure your test scores are not there. Okay. So for schools that allow you to self-report, that's all you have to do. You can do it through the Common App. But for schools that we, um, ask you to send official test scores only, you're going to need to log either into the College Board account, your College Board account, or your ACT account, and order the test scores to be sent. So if you are applying for a January deadline for regular decision, that's something that you need to probably be taking care of right now. We're midway through December. So you want to go ahead and go in and order any official test scores that need to be sent um, so that you don't forget about that, submit your app, and then remember, oh, or have the school saying, uh, we're sorry, you're, all of your documents were not here in time, you're, you're late, you're not going to be considered, or they have to continuously tell you to send your, your test scores in. So that's one tip that you want to remember. The other thing is, and especially if you attend a, a large public school, is you need to make sure that you're communicating with your counselor, especially over winter break. And I worked for 20 years in a public school, now I'm in a small independent school. I only have 40 seniors. So if 
most of my seniors, I know exactly what they're doing and I have a few outstanding applications. I'm gonna be home for the break. They've already ordered their uh, teacher letters of rec and everything is ready to go. I just told them, let me know and I could go ahead and upload all the documents, no problem. But if you're working in a lot, attending a large public school, there's a very high probability that your school counselor is gonna be off for two weeks. Um, your teachers are gonna be off for two weeks and they're, they may not be doing any work over that break. Um, they also have hundreds of students that they're dealing with. So hopefully, especially if tomorrow is your last day before winter break, you probably need to get into your counseling office and just say, look, I need to submit a, um, a regular decision app over winter break. And your counselor may then, then want to go in and immediately upload all the documents before you, before you leave for the day. And that's fine. Your documents can get there before you actually submit the application and it'll all match up on the back end. But make sure that you're following the policies and procedures and the timeline of your school. And you also want to make sure, hopefully, fingers crossed, you guys have already asked for letters of rec to be uploaded into whatever, uh, if you use SCORE, you use Maya Learning, Naviance, or if you just do it directly through Common App. Because if you send a, a, a request for a letter of rec um, on the first day of break, for something that's due on January 1, there is a very good chance that your teachers are on actual break and they're not gonna write that letter. So hopefully you've taken care of that. Um, there's also, I referenced the grid that you can pull up on the Common App. And this here will tell you um, what schools have, what deadlines, what fees and requirements. And this will tell you also if teacher letters are required, if mid-year reports are required and that kind of thing. So you wanna make sure for any application that you're making sure that you understand all the different components. And again, this can be very confusing for students. We understand that. So utilize your, um, your school counselor, um, your college counselor, or whoever you might be working with on this process uh, to make sure that you haven't missed anything. And the best way to do that is to read the website, read the application, and you can also look here on this Common App grid. Tom, did you have anything to add here? The only thing I wanted to add was that I specifically chose the R's schools for your, for Renee. So. Oh, that's so sweet. Little small love, detail you may not have noticed, but I it was very that. intentional. Oh, yeah. very sweet. Very sweet. Um, so uh, the other thing is you um, also have had, hopefully with regular decision being a January deadline, um, there may be some February ones out there. I think I've seen, but for the most part, it's going to be January one, the first week of January, January 15th. Hopefully you've had an entire semester to read through everything on the website and the application. If you have not, then hopefully you will take this time after you hear us telling you this is really important that you will go through and do this. And I'm going to tell you a little story that this actually happened to one of my students this year. Um, he was applying to many colleges in the, across the country, but he's he wants to be a pilot, a commercial pilot. So he's applying to flight school. Flight school is a little bit different. There are sometimes majors and different different things that are different than the norm, and you really need to dig deep to see what you need to do. So he applied to numerous flight schools, and one in particular, I won't name the school, um, he applied by the deadline, which everything looked on the up and up according to what he saw, and then he found out, he got an email from the school on, I, I wanna say this was um, December 1, a December 1 deadline, and he got an email from the school on December 2 saying, your supplemental essays and supplemental documents were due uh, are due on December 1st. But he got the email on December 2nd because he waited until the actual deadline to submit and didn't know that there were other optional, not optional, other required pieces that needed to be in by December 1. So in my opinion, the college would have made it easier if they would have said that the application was due on November 15 and the additional pieces would have been due two weeks later. But I don't work for that college, so I didn't get to make that decision. The student finding out on December 2 that these things were due on December 1 was now told, your application is active and we will review it, but you're no longer going to be considered for the flight program. So he was really disappointed, and I went back and forth with the admissions um, office, and they told me, yes, that's true, and there's nothing. And by the time we figured all this out, I think it was December 5th when he came in to me and told me this. And I said, well, you know, and he, he was really upset at himself because he missed it right there on the website. So that is just one little story to emphasize that read everything, um, especially if you're applying for a major that might be a little bit out of the ordinary or has some additional components, 
maybe like your art school or, or art majors yeah. and things like that, where you have auditions and different things. Um, again, this is reiterating what we said on the, the previous slide, but if you're sending test scores, please be sure you know how they need to be submitted. If they need to be official, please order those now. Um, also, if you're applying for financial aid, now as we you may know, we know, um, uh, the college counselors know that the FAFSA, which is the Federal Application for Student Aid, and this is, uh, it comes out every year on October 1, but this year, this process has been delayed. It's a very late rollout. What we're hearing is it's gonna roll out on December 31st, which is New Year's Eve. So that's not the best day that I, I would think of that the government could roll something out. But um, if, if um, you didn't know this, most students should apply, for, um, should use FAFSA. And this is the application that will determine if you will qualify for any need-based aid. Now, some selective schools will also have uh, required the CSS profile, which is a more of an institutional financial aid app. The FAFSA is a federal uh, aid methodology that's calculated. Now, the CSS profile was open, did open on October 1. So if you're applying to a selective school that requires the CSS profile, you should probably get with your family and get that done ASAP, all right? Because that one has already been opened. As far as FAFSA, you have to wait. But the one thing I, I was on a webinar last night, and this is a really big tip if you didn't hear this already, since FAFSA may open on December 31, and this is a, it's changed from years past. So if you, you had a sibling or you're a parent on here and you've had other students go through this process, other children, you probably um, did the FAFSA with them. But the change is that every single member of the family, well, every adult, the parents and the, the student, need to acquire an FSA ID. So you will need, you can go on there now and apply for your FSA ID. Student has to do that and the parent has to do that. Both parents should do it if your parents are married and you live with both parents. Um, and that's gonna take a good three to five days, they're saying for you to get the FSA ID back. And then you, if you do this now, two weeks prior to when they're supposed to roll this out, you should have that those the number ready to go and then you can submit your FAFSA as soon as you can. I wouldn't do it on New Year's Eve, but maybe wait until the first or the second. Um, and also look at um, what the deadlines are for that particular school for FAFSA. And they usually, usually is early, but it's gonna roll, it's probably gonna be February at this point because it's coming out so late. So we can go to the next slide. I think this one's yours, Tom. Yeah, so I just want to—I I do want to let everyone know we're going to try to get through as many of the points as on our agenda as we possibly can. Thank you, Todd, in the chat for letting us know. Um, I'll try to go through these next ones pretty quickly because these are kind of a little more of like the optional components that actually can enhance your your candidacy at this point. Um, but hopefully, the kind of like pragmatic stuff we're putting forward in the beginning is really hitting home. So something I want to just put out there um, before I kind of move on to the optional components and the demonstrated interest section. Um, is um, clarifying in your head what are what I would call substantive moves versus lateral moves when it comes to thinking about all the different things that you're being asked to do with this application process right now, right? The substantive moves that actually make a difference in your process are communicating a range of your skills, qualities, values, and interests to colleges. That is your number one job with your actual application, the things you're writing, the things you're putting together. There are optional um, ways that colleges will allow you to do even more of that that we'll get to in a second, um, such as interviews such as um, video responses. Um, so that's something that I think just really kind of keeping in mind, that's your goal. Um, all the things that you see on the right side, like worrying about whether or not to use bright or shiny as a word on your second paragraph of your personal statement, those are really distinctions that really are not gonna make a big difference in your process. So overthinking and running through your head, all these kind of essays and how people are going to think of them, um, it really can kind of get you into, a, I'd say a real trap when it comes to actually getting things crossed off your to-do list. Um, so that's just one thing that I, it's kind of decision-making matrix in your head to kind of think about as you go through this. So one thing that you can do to improve your chances at regular decision schools is to take advantage of all the optional um, opportunities that colleges will allow you to do. So many schools will allow you to submit, especially increasingly so, things like video responses. There might be interviews that colleges offer to students. Um, there may be additional essays that students can complete. Um, and basically our big tip here is to do those things. <laughs> um, those are things that they are optional and definitely for some students, depending on the individual, say they're like, oh, 
me being on camera doing an interview is really anxiety inducing. So I'd rather write a supplement or email an admissions officer. That's all fine and good. I would say if you're comfortable, if you're able to, if you have um, the ability to do some of the optional things that colleges are asking you, doing it as opposed to not doing it all, I'd say is a better approach. Even if you're kind of nervous about flubbing your words or saying lots of ums and ahs, for example, on these video responses, that's something that these colleges, like I'll tell you after, I had a student who I worked with on a video response. Basically these are colleges will ask you different prompts and, and things. And they'll ask you like, what's a favorite family like holiday tradition that you have? And you might have a few minutes to respond to it. Schools like Swarthmore and schools like Bowdoin do that. There are other schools that kind of allow you to do a more general video introduction. And you can go up right onto YouTube and see lots of different videos that students have put up in the past to try to help other students with the things that they've shared in their application in these video responses. Um, it's something that's increasingly kind of being asked of students more going forward. Um, and these are some tips that Bowdoin actually has left on their website about this particular video response. So my biggest tip here is really not to overthink it as much. The student who I worked with last year who did a video um, kind of introduction in two minutes for University of Chicago, she talked about making milkshakes for students in her dorm. She went to a boarding school and how that's a tradition that they used to do. They do at U Chicago as well, milkshake Mondays and how each of the different ingredients like represented different sides of her. She had like cameos from her siblings in the background. They were making all this noise like she had a little can like laugh track. So, um, but in general, in terms of the actual, like, you know, the tech specs of it, it was an iPhone video, very kind of low tech. And these colleges are really cool with that. They don't need you to have big expensive, expensive production value music, kind of all these different things, these bells and whistles. They really kind of want to just get to know more about you and hear a little bit more about your story beyond things that you've shared in your essays. So there's a video here on the slideshow that you can kind of watch at your own leisure. Um, another opportunity that colleges have provided to students um, increasingly are optional portfolios and supplements. So in, uh, to clarify or kind of to distinguish between supplemental essays, um, colleges do, of course, have optional supplemental essays, which I'll get to in a second. Um, but many colleges actually allow you to submit what's called like a portfolio of either say you're a musician or you're a singer or you're a dancer, drama, thespian. You have done research and a college allows you to submit a research portfolio that will be reviewed by their faculty. Lots of schools kind of offer things like that. And it's not something that's always super obvious if you don't actually look on their website and know that it's something that they offer to students. Um, sometimes they may mention it on the common application page for the school. But again, it's something that you kind of getting a sense for, say you do have one of these talents that you see here on the screen and you're like, oh, I don't know if any of the colleges that I've, I'm applying to are asking me to do this. Definitely take a look and see if schools you're applying to are because it can be something that really enhances your candidacy. So at Pomona, we had students all the time who, even if they weren't majoring in music, if they were a really talented saxophone player and they sent in a portfolio because we allowed students who weren't even majoring in music to, because it's for the orchestra and the jazz band and all these kind of different ensembles that we were tasked as an admissions team to find students to fulfill those needs. Um, so if a school does offer an optional portfolio for art, you know, music, whatnot, it's a good idea to send that in if it's open to you, if it's open to students who are not majoring in that area. Um, I mean, I guess one thing to kind of ask yourself is like taking a look at the quality of or like listening to an orchestra and seeing like, could I actually contribute? Because that will kind of let you know. It's okay, if, for example, if you're kind of like the more basic, like if you just started out last year and you're kind of like, oh, I'm like flubbing through my like little you know, Suzuki flute book, and I'm only on chapter two, like, you may not be at the level of talent that the school is looking for. And that is okay. Um, it means that kind of putting all this time and energy into putting portfolio for your particular more hobby, kind of more lax approach to that area, you probably don't need to. But if you've been invested in for multiple years and multiple seasons in a particular talent, and want to showcase that to a school, it really can enhance your candidacy a lot. Um, and then, of course, these short responses. So many colleges actually have essays that are available to students through their um, applicant portfolio or sorry, their applicant portal. And I'm, I'm going to get to that in a second. Um, and one of them, for example, is NYU and Williams. They also they allow students to send in optional essays that are not required, but again, are really going to enhance the candidacy. So definitely something to look out for um, from individual <laughs> colleges. Um, oftentimes these are actually responses that you have to complete after you've applied to the school. So Holy Cross is one school that has a Holy Cross response. It's kind of like, how have you learned about the school? 
I had a student that I worked with last year who chose not to send this response in because she thought for sure she was going to be admitted and she ended up being waitlisted. And I kind of told her from personal experience, having worked there, that that probably would happen. Um, but she just didn't want to spend the time putting together the 100 word response. Um, and it really kind of did result in that waitlist decision in the end. So um, this kind of theme of demonstrated interest, just for the sake of time, Renee, I know <laughs> this is your section, but I'm kind of just going to go through this pretty quickly. Um, okay. Demonstrated interest is something that is, um, it's never a bad idea. And a lot of times people try to really overly complicate it, but essentially it's any way that you're exploring a college or university that's documented. So registering for a program, a, a virtual program or an in-person campus tour, or you know, interacting with a student that's organized through the admissions office, making sure that the admissions team knows that you've engaged with the, that school in a meaningful way to learn more about it, learn more about their programs, learn more about the culture of the campus. That's something that no matter where you're applying, this is something that can really help your candidacy. Because even for me at Pomona, a school that didn't, didn't measure or track demonstrated interest, we still had documented you know, things that students were doing. And while I never used that as a, a rationale to admit a student, I couldn't say like, oh, the student has attended all of our programs, so we should admit them because they like us a lot. Um, I did have students who I had like really nice interactions with like during my time as an admissions officer. And because students sent me a thoughtful email or made the time to chat with me after a college fair or whatnot, um, I was more likely to want to advocate for them in the committee room. So again, demonstrated interest is something that's really, it doesn't hurt your candidacy at all. Um, and it can really, really enhance it. Um, all these slides are available to you now going forward, because I know we weren't able to get to all of them just with the time allotted. I'm happy to stay on for a few more questions. The last, we have all these guides, <laughs> basically we'll kind of walk you through how to demonstrate interest kind of more meaningfully to schools. Um, and then this last thing that we wanted to mention before we kind of wrap up is just the importance of application portals. So this, this can cause a lot of confusion to students. So we just wanted to like really quickly mention what this means. So whenever you apply to a college, you send in your application through the common app or whatever it may be, you'll usually receive an email um, and it's best to use a personal email um, and to make sure to check your spam because sometimes you don't always get those notifications with a username and password uh, or a way to set that up for the individual college's application portal. So once you've sent in all those apps through regular decision and you cheers yourself or you know holiday toast or New Year's Eve, whatever you wanna do, um, that's when you're gonna to wanna to keep an eye out in your email for communications from colleges. It's really important to make sure your portal is set up and ready to go because that is where colleges will let you know about missing documents. If you need to send in your mid-year grades or you need to submit official test scores or some of those optional video responses I mentioned or optional um, writing components. Um, oftentimes those are going to be things that you upload and send to the school through your application portal, as opposed to through the common app. It's basically like, once you send in all those apps, you're pretty much done with the common app and never need to really log into there anymore. It's all going to be individually communicated to you by each individual school in different ways through these different portals. So unfortunately it's a lot to keep track of. I recommend kind of keeping you know, username, password, logins, links, whatever you want to do, maybe a spreadsheet with all the links to these application portals just to make things easier for you. Um, but that's something that, again, is really going to help you be making sure that you're not dropping the ball in any way, kind of like the story that Renee shared earlier about not knowing that this thing was due for this scholarship or whatnot. Um, really kind of keeping an eye out for those communications from colleges is super, super important at this stage. Uh, so I know we went over on, on two minutes and I'm happy to stay on longer just because um, we have a lot to talk to on this topic. Um, so I'll stay on for a few minutes in case folks have questions. Um, but also definitely know that we want to respect your time. And if you have to head out, you're of course free to go at any point. Um, I'll stay too. Let's see, um, questions from the doc. So let's see. So PowerPoint, um, yes, I'll share that for you, um, uh, Melanie, or actually we can have Jasmine share that for you um, in case you are curious, yeah. But if you have yeah, any questions about, you know, if you're working on a video response or working on a supplemental uh, individual response to a college, um, someone just uh, asked a question, do you recommend early decision two or regular de decision more? Renee, do you wanna tackle that one? What was the question? Do you, do you, do you recommend 
early decision two or regular decision more? Oh, okay. Well, that that is a that's an interesting question. I mean, that right there, you have to decide if early decision two is a binding contract. So you must really want to go to this school before you would apply early decision two. Um, there was probably a little bit of a better chance to get in admit rate wise for early decision two than maybe regular decision. But I think that that needs to probably be your, your number two school on your list. Maybe you applied ED1 somewhere else, didn't get in and maybe have an, a number two school for ED2. There's also options sometimes certain schools will allow you if they um, deferred you to maybe turn around and say, well, I'd like to go ED2. I know Tulane has done that before. Um, there's some other schools that do that, but that's really an individual choice. Uh, if you're asking as far as admit rates is concerned, probably ED2 would have a higher rate. I didn't see the question. So is it one of the ones that are typed in here? Oh, it was it was sent to me via direct message. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, All right. But I mean, in general, I would say um, early decision two, just for those of you who are not as familiar, if you applied early decision one to a college, um, it's uh, usually students are kind of finding out around this time, um, this week or next. Um, early decision two, it really is the same kind of like binding agreement to a school. You agree to attend that school if you're admitted. But the only difference really is that you find out late, like late, you find out usually in kind of like late January, maybe mid February. Um, so in terms of recommending it more than the other, it just depends on how excited you are about the college that you want to apply early decision to, to if you're, if you feel like you have to apply early decision to, because you're going to lose your chance, um, at a competitive school or whatever it may be. Um, I would not apply early decision right. to if you're like half baked, <laughs> if you're like kind of half interested in the school, you know, that's kind of um, a sign that maybe applying more regular decision to have more options to choose from is probably a better route for you and your own individual decision making, you know, matrix. Right. I, there's a question here about the FAFSA and I just learned this last night. The question is, um, the student is a U.S. citizen and both parents are non-U.S. citizens. So do, do both parents also have to get FAFSA ID? So what I learned last night is that um, the student has to have, have an FSA ID and they would have, if they're a U.S. citizen, would have a social security number. If the parents are non-U.S. citizens and don't have a social security number, they can still get an FSA ID and they both would have to do that as well. I think that you put in um, all zeros for the social security number if this is going off my memory from yesterday, but you would still get an FSA ID and then your student would have theirs, but they would have a social security number. So all of this is, they're probably gonna roll out all kinds of um, you know, tutorials and different ways for you to get help on the new FAFSA. It's called Better FAFSA. And if you Google that, there are already some tools that you can go in and look at to see how to answer some of these questions. But that is one that I learned yesterday, so. Let's see what are some of the other ones. I saw a question coming from Sarah that some students who have not, who may not have the best grades but are having a good semester academically want to wait for RD to apply. What do you think of this strategy? Um, I definitely think, you know, say if a student has been on an upward trend with their grades and they chose, you know, to not apply early decision to a school because they want their senior year performance, they're, they're motivated, they're ready to continue to do well academically and they want that kind of most recent software update of themselves to be the one that colleges are looking at first and foremost, that totally makes sense. Um, so again, in terms of the strategy, um, there's of course pros and cons, you know, um, definitely applying early, you know, at this point, the ship has kind of sailed. So <laughs> there's not much point in kind of like trying to turn back time there, but I'd say, you know, definitely waiting to apply regular decision because you want your senior year performance to be what's evaluated the most heavily. Um, is certainly a strong counseling strategy um, for depending on the individual student and their their progress and their their background. Right, and if um, if this student who asked the question is a junior, then that there is time. I don't know. We don't know the grades of everybody who's on here, but I do have students um, that they have started to improve, and maybe they want to add some more rigor into their senior year, and they want to have that first semester um, set of grades to be able to show the college that. Now I can, you know, I'm able to handle higher level rigorous courses. So that's another reason that some students might wait 
and apply regular as grades and rigor as a possibility. So that was a good question. How I saw one from Olivia, which is how, how do you decide if you want to go to a community college and transfer um, after two years or go straight to a four year university? It's a great question, Olivia. I would say um, it depends on your own individual kind of goals. I think if you're already kind of currently going through the college application process and you want to kind of throw your hat in the ring at some schools and see what happens, um, you don't have anything to lose by sending in those applications now and making the decision later on when you've had more time to evaluate your financial needs. Maybe you're someone who has family needs close to home or a job where um, the idea of kind of going to community college, living at home is just a better, better suited for your individual situation. It's hard to provide as much guidance because I don't, I don't know you as well. Um, and I, I don't know kind of like what your individual needs are when it comes to education, but I'd say, you know, throwing in those applications now and seeing what happens is, is that way you actually have options in place to make that decision. It's better to, I'd say, apply and then go the community college route, which doesn't require, you know, a long application process, multiple months of waiting. Because if you don't apply now, you have to wait an entire other year to apply to a lot of these four-year colleges. So I'd say send the applications in. In terms of making the decision, that might be a webinar for another day in terms of like, should I go to community college, save money? But you might get a, you know, what if you get a really amazing scholarship at a four-year school you're really excited about or merit aid or there's, um, if you apply for need-based aid, it could actually maybe even be on par or cheaper than the community college option you were thinking. Not always, but sometimes depending on some students and schools they apply to, that does end up being the case. So um, that's something that I would probably recommend to you. Um, well, there's one from Marianne about the CSS profile. And it says, is the CSS profile form standardized and from a particular organization or does each college have their own type of CSS form? Is there anywhere to go to see this form? That's a really good question. So, all right. So I mentioned earlier about the different financial aid forms. So the FAFSA is the federal form and every college in the US is using FAFSA. And that is uh, the way that the federal government will calculate your, uh, used to be called estimated family contribution. New term is gonna be student aid index, okay? Some colleges will ask for a CSS profile. The CSS profile is actually um, owned by the college board, the same people who own the SAT, because I think you wanted to know if there was a co different companies for this. It's just one application, and it's only asked for by about 200 schools, I believe, of just going off memory in the US. So you have to see first if your school asks for the CSS profile. If they do, it's an institutional methodology for calculating need based aid. So the school itself, has certain questions that they wanna ask on top of what they get from the FAFSA to decide um, how much money they might give you. So it's not something that you can just decide to do at any school. You have to see if they ask for it. And if they ask for it, then you would create your, it, th there should be a link somewhere on the college website. If it says you must do the CSS profile, you probably can click the link and it'll take you directly to the website. But it should say college board somewhere on that website. I believe it's purple. When you get there, there, you know, just that's another point is to make sure that you're on the correct site because there are some fat, there used to be some FAFSA sites that were like, if it's .org, it was like .com and it would ask you to pay money and things like that. So you want to make sure that you're on the correct site. Um, but I think hopefully that answered your question about the CSS profile. It's only needed if asked for. Most schools don't ask for it though. Yeah. And Jen shared a great tip in the chat of, I found that schools that require the CSS are actually really helpful about the profile and the questions that are asked and they have a chat function and customer service. So that's great to know, especially if you are not, not knowing what a certain question that's being asked is, or unfortunately there is distinction between individual CSS profiles from college to college. It is a customizable form, unlike the FAFSA, which is standardized. Well, you know, who knows? We haven't seen it yet. So, you know, <laughs> time will tell, but um, yeah. Um, and then the question about IDOC, Renee, do you want to just briefly mention that just because some folks in the chat are are um, asking about that? The, okay, I didn't see the question, but the IDOC is um, for international students. And if the school, um, if for instance, if you are international and you can't fill out the, the FAFSA because you don't, neither you nor your parents are U.S. citizens, there may be um, a institutional documents that ask you to fill out financial uh, 
information. So the CSS profile, I believe, can be filled out if you're international. There are ways to fill that out. And then a lot of colleges will have an IDOC on top of it. Um, if you're, you, when you're applying as an international student, you're gonna be looking under admissions for first year students, but you're also gonna look under international admissions. And it should list out all the things that you are required in addition to the regular admissions process. And I didn't see what the question was about IDOC. Is it just, what was the question? It's most kind of like, what is it slash, you know, oh, what um, is it? Okay. Um, once it's completed, you can figure out if a school requires document uploads. Yeah. Okay. So. And for those who are asking what a CSS profile is, it's a great question. <laughs> um, a little impromptu financial aid overview. Um, so essentially in the US, the two main documents that you'll be asked to complete, um, depending on the, your college list for financial aid are the FAFSA, the Free Application for Federal Student Aid, pretty much required by every US college that receives federal funding. So that's one that pretty much anyone should be filling out the FAFSA because even if you don't have high financial need, there are still some schools that ask you to do it. and it's actually a requirement to receive scholarship money, like merit-based, non-need-based aid at some schools. Right. So filling out the FAFSA is always a good idea. Um, well, if it was released, so we'll see. Um, when it is, definitely I would recommend doing it. Um, it'll be a, a great bonding experience for all of us. We'll, we'll all be in this together, new, new horizons. The CSS profile, in contrast, is a little more institution-specific. So um, well, the FAFSA has a list of standardized questions that every college that uses it, it's the same questions, but the CSS profile is a customizable form that individual colleges will change depending on the ways that they measure how much need you need. So an example of that would be some schools with the CSS profile, they'll measure things like home equity and how much your home is worth right. as a factor in what you can afford for college. Other schools will not have that particular question or you know, uh, factor in terms of the term that is called institutional methodology right. for how they calculate how much need you have. So those really, that's really the distinction between the two forms. FAFSA, pretty universal. Any school that asks for need or offers need-based aid will have that form. And the CSS profile is more rare, but still for a lot of these schools that meet a lot of demonstrated need, they provide a lot of grant aid that you never have to pay back and loans to make sure that you can afford, you know, as much as possible. Um, the total cost, um, you'll see the CSS profile for those schools. Yeah, there are some students who are asking their juniors who are on this call. So if you're a junior, <laughs> pretend this, I actually am a little scared for you because this was a, maybe a little more geared, especially to students who were like, as seniors applying to colleges and you know maybe they applied early and now are looking for regular schools. So um, if some of this felt kind of like, I don't know what they're talking about. We have a lot of more introductory one-on-one -on -one things. Like what is a what is the common app, for example, at College Essa Guy that can help you more with that? Um, but Megan, to answer your question of um, how do I start working on essay prompts ahead of time? Unfortunately, you can't really do a lot too, too early when it comes to college-specific supplemental essays um, early on or during the spring or early summer. The common application resets every year at on August 1st. And at that point, colleges are expected to have new, if they require supplemental college specific essays that only, you know, um, Pomona ha will have a different question from Claremont McKenna and they'll have USC will have a different question um, or small essays that students will be asked to complete. Um, those are usually available August 1st. So you have a little bit of time to um, prepare for that. I would say though, the questions tend to be pretty similar. So at College Essay Guy, we have lots of resources around how to write a why us essay, which is basically like, why do you want to attend this school? Um, a lot of colleges will ask you to write an essay about your lived experience and your identity. So kind of thinking about that and what you may want to share, you can start to brainstorm ideas and content topics ahead of time, but writing the actual essay itself, like with the word count and the particular way that they phrased it in the question, you want to wait until after August 1st before writing essays for schools that actually, and this happens every year, kids will write essays from the previous year's prompts, and then it will be work that they can't always really use the way that they wanted to. Um, oftentimes they can recycle it and use it for other schools. Uh, but yeah, I'd say wait till August 1st for kind of that real nitty gritty essay writing for the college specific stuff. In the brainstorming work, you can definitely do ahead of time. Um, personal, personal essay though, personal statement we have yeah, at College Essay Guy. That. Basically that's like the name of the game with what we do. You can do that far ahead of time. Those questions, um, the prompts for the personal statement are not even really that 
important to be honest <laughs> like um they're more to give you a sense of the types of things that the college is hoping to hear about um but really any story that's kind of about yourself your life experience your goals and aspirations especially your more recent iterations of yourself not a story from when you were like four years old entirely um that's going to be something that can really um you can definitely start working on that sooner than later yeah and i was on the common app advisory board for years and i don't think they've changed their props really mm -hmm. at at all um maybe tweaked it or maybe tweak a question. But the most important thing about the personal statement uh, prompts is that number seven is write a story about anything you want. So you can definitely start that one. And it's always, it's been 650 words for many, many years. Um, and they usually make this, this statement about their prompts around March each year. So at least you can get a head start there. And that's the biggest essay usually that you'll write with some exception. There are some schools that have 600 word essays, but for the most or supplemental essays, but for the most part, that's your largest essay. So. Yeah, so something that I just want to do a really quick little screen share of is um, I there was a mom in the chat that was saying, you "No, know, hey, I'm a mom of a junior, and like <laughs> this is all a lot to take in." So definitely, I think you're you're coming in at an interesting time in the timeline of the cycle because this session really is mostly geared towards senior students and families who have already kind of been in the thick of it and maybe have heard these terms before and are more familiar with all these things that we've mentioned. So if you are really just starting out, this is the College Essay Guy main website, um, your home for college admission and application support. And um, you'll get, you know, by being on our email list, you'll get invited to lots of different free webinars, programs. But what I would kind of do is go to the website and then go to the ready to dive in section that's right at the beginning. You can choose the page that makes the most sense for you. And we give recommendations about wherever you're at in the process, if you're starting early, or, you know, maybe you're a ninth grade parent or family who's tuning into this webinar. If so, then this probably was very <laughs> in the weeds for you. But uh, these kind of individual pages will kind of give you, I'd say the most um, appropriate, like, <laughs> like the developmentally appropriate content, essentially, like, it's basically like the G rated to the PG to the PG 13, like, it's kind of going to give you, you know, what is the most relevant to your situation based on how far along you are with the college process and journey. So early on, it's more things about like, what do I value? And how can I spend my time in high school to, you know, be fulfilled and put together an application I'm really excited about. And then, you know, transitioning more towards 11th and 12th grade is when you start to get more into the weeds of like building your college list and which application deadlines to consider, um, how to actually write the essays and put the application together. Um, so yeah, definitely these, these pages here are going to be a, a really great way for you to know what makes the most sense for you to tune into or read or, or look into um, based on your, your, where you're entering into the pipeline, I guess you could say. Nice. Any final questions, Renee? I know. I think we've. Um, um, there was a question about um, being an international student and not having IB or um, AP classes. Uh, um, so great on. question. Oh, you did. Okay. Okay. Great. No, I, I saw the question. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> um, so, to answer that question, and for any of you who are tuning in. Um, regardless of what your your high school offers in terms of curriculum, that is actually not something that really needs to be a concern to you in terms of your application process. So colleges evaluate students based on the individual high school that they're coming from. There are some schools or some colleges that like reevaluate your GPA and things like that, um, or have certain expectations of courses you need to apply. So for example, UK, the UK schools, United Kingdom schools, so we're not talking about the US here, but they actually do require like things like AP scores to be a competitive applicant app. But anyway, in the US, um, it's based on what, what is available in your high school in terms of what the admissions officer is hoping to see on your transcript. So if you come from a school with AP classes, they and it's a more selective college, they typically want to see that you've embraced some of those advanced placement classes as because your school offers it to you. Um, if your school has an IB diploma, International Baccalaureate School, um, you probably want to think about taking advantage of that if you're looking at these more selective colleges that have lower acceptance rates. Um, but if you don't have those curriculums, it's not something that impacts your candidacy. Um, and I'm really speaking, I don't work for a college. I'm not on commission. Like I, I worked there for years. So I'm just saying this to you very plainly. Like there's no, it's, there's no way to kind of evaluate a student and say, well, they should have taken APs like online or down the street or something. 
Um, so hopefully that kind of relieves you a little bit in terms of um, feeling like you're missing out on a competitive edge by not having those courses because every high school is different and not all schools have the same course offering. So it really is dependent on what you have. Yeah. Um... Brooke asked, um, I'm an international high school senior and um, I'm planning to take a gap year and apply to colleges in 2024. Um, will that be a problem? Nope. Gap years are very, very common. It's actually very common all around the world. Basically everywhere other than the US is like pretty um, con on with like gap years and increasingly more and more students here are doing as well. A lot of students um, with the pandemic decided to take a gap year instead of enrolling virtually on different campuses. So if you're taking a gap year, I hope it's an amazing experience. I hope you're able to either spend a, your time working at a great job or, you know, maybe you want to do some travel experiences or I did something called woofing. It wasn't for a gap year, but um, it was called willing workers on organic farms. And we like worked um, and did like in exchange for free housing and food, <laughs> we did like work on whatever placement site that you were sent to. Um, so that's something that, you know, gap years are a great way to take a break between instead of applying, you know, going straight from school and, you know, enrolling in college, having that time to kind of have more clarity about what you're interested in, what you, how you want to prioritize that with your college process. It's very, very normal to do that. And you can either apply to schools now and say, Hey, I'd like to take a gap year, or you can do the gap year and go through the application process next year um, and next fall. Um, Tom, there is a question here from Melanie and it was way up and she asked it again. So I want to make sure we answer that, but it says, should I keep applying to schools RD just in case I'm unable to finance my accepted ED decision? Okay, so with ED, um, you know, it is a binding decision. There, if let's say that you did your due diligence and you did a net price calculator and you went through all that you could look for to see if you felt like you and your family could afford it, and in the end, um, the school comes back, admits you, and the offer is way off base from what you saw or maybe talk to them about, um, then you may be able to get out of an ED decision. That's really the only case that I know that you're allowed to get out of it. Um, so yes, you can still apply to regular decision schools in case you don't get accepted. I have you already, I, I guess the question is, we don't know if you've been accepted to um, ED, but it looks like you may have been already accepted. And so you're now waiting to see what your financial aid offer is. I don't know, Tom, do you have anything else to add about that? I think. Not really, yeah. I mean, when it comes to early decision and financial aid offers, I do know that that's pretty much the only um, reason that a school that has an early decision and application process will like release you from that commitment. Um, typically schools are pretty serious about that commitment and expect that you have kind of done the homework ahead of time to know your finances, but situations come up where it's really hard to predict that. And there's changes in circumstances and it happens every year um, at every, every, every school. Um, so yeah, definitely know that, you know, ideally what you, A, you get in and you get the money that you're looking for, but just know that um, if for whatever reason things don't work out, um, colleges tend to be pretty agreeable and understanding um, with allowing you to you know, consider other options at that stage. Uh, um, Kirsten asks, yeah, once a student has been accepted early decision, that student isn't allowed to apply to more schools, right? Um, uh, yeah, that is, yes, that's the way that the yeah. policy is structured. The agreement mm -hmm. is that if you are admitted, you can still have applications, you know, going when you apply early decision to a school, you can still put in applications other places. But the agreement is that if you are admitted there, you'll withdraw your applications from those other schools and attend that institution. The only real fine print there or asterisks is that financial challenges is, is the real only, I guess, rationale that some families and students will, um, will take them out of the binding agreement. But it's something that ideally you don't want to step into that territory. Um, because you want to try to be more proactive with understanding the financial commitment beforehand, using things like a net price calculator, or contacting the financial aid office to see whether or not they have aid policies or scholarship policies that make sense for you. So, yeah, but yes, it, it in theory, you know, on the way that it's written, yeah. that's and this year is a little weird because of the FAFSA being delayed, yeah. and I think that's what I'm, I've been getting more questions about this as well because the 
actual financial aid package is not 100% without the FAFSA. Um, they can give an estimate, but it, so they're not, I think you have to really go with your the college and get guidance there. If you've been admitted ED and just, you know, if you haven't give, been given an actual financial aid package, they probably give you some verbiage when they admit you saying, you know, you'll find your financial aid package out by this date and then maybe they'll tell you what to do from there. But this is a different weird year. It's not normally like this. Normally you get your ED de decision and your financial aid package all at one time. And then you're supposed to withdraw all of your other apps. So, yeah. Yeah, I think let me have the last question for the night um, is from iPad3. <laughs> um, so hi, I applied early decision and didn't early action any schools. I'm wondering if, if I should add more schools to my list. I currently have nine. I'm applying for regular decision. They all have acceptance rates under 20%. My counselor wants me to add a safety school, but I heard that you shouldn't apply to schools that you're not going to attend. What should I do? Um, that is a great question, iPad3. I would probably agree with your counselor. And my recommendation, my rationale around this is that just looking at if the schools that you're applying to all have acceptance rates under 20%, that means that 80% of the students are not going to get in. And the majority of the students who are applying to these schools are probably like you, incredibly qualified academically, have been involved in high school in various capacities for multiple years, have goals and aspirations and great skills, qualities, values, and interests to contribute. Um, these applicant pools are not, they are not shy on that profile that it's the majority of people who apply to those schools are very competitive applicants, um, but there just isn't enough. It's an issue of space and not about quality. Um, so on that vein, I would really work as much as possible to try to identify the things, common th the threads, and the things that excite you most about the schools that have under 20% acceptance rate. Is it that they have good X pro good programs for computer science or that they're all located in the Northeast, right? Try to find kind of some of the elements that are attracting you to those schools and then try and find um, more safety oriented schools that have some of those dream. Cause I, I try not to have people talk about like dream schools, not because I don't think you should have a dream because dreams are great. Um, mm -hmm. But only because um, especially when the, if the dream schools are all kind of some of these really highly selective places, there is a really high statistical likelihood that you might not have as many options that you want in the end. Um, so that would be the last thing that I think you would want for yourself and that your counselor wants for you, maybe your family wants for you. So um, I, I do think kind of adding in some schools that are a little more um, less scary when it comes to the overall acceptance rate um, is something I'd recommend doing just because, yeah, the last thing you would want is to not have any options at all. Um, and because sometimes students will be like, well, if I don't get into these places, then I'll just reapply the next year. It may just get even more and more competitive and more complicated. And it's kind of like you may want to just throw in something now and maybe you will get into a really great honors program at one of those more safety schools that actually provides you with individual research grants and study abroad opportunities that are fully funded and things like that. Um, it happens every year. There's a great book called Where You Go Is Not Who You'll Be by Frank Bruni. And he talks a lot about schools that kind of have things like that that are really exciting opportunities for students at schools where it's easier to get into, but you have a lot of opportunities that you would have just as much at those more selective schools to make your mark, to make a statement, to engage and really dive deep into the things you're excited about. So yeah, that's a little preachy, but I, I would probably agree with your counselor there. I don't know if you have any tips more concretely to add Renee about like getting excited about safety schools. I mean, the thing is, and, and when I, I don't even like the word safety because it, it just, it, it sounds Same. like just like yeah. a backup plan, right? Um, I, there are a lot of schools out there that if you're a really good student, you could find schools out there that are, have a 50% admit rate or so that you would have a, a better chance to get in and would probably be an excellent fit. I think the thing is your counselor doesn't want you to be left out in the cold. And if you have nowhere to go, and you try to reapply next year, I don't know what would change unless you change your entire list of schools. Um, if you just try to reapply to the same schools the following year, that, that may not work either. So you might need to broaden your horizons. And I think the tip that you made, or you said, Tom, about um, honors programs, those are hidden gems at a lot of these schools. I mean, you could go to a school that has a very high admit rate, but you can have a, almost a smaller, almost like a a private school experience at a large flagship where you have small class sizes and you get first dibs on your uh, signing up for your classes and so forth. So 
I think maybe go back to your counselors and have a conversation about maybe they have some suggestions for you. Maybe look at that because you have a couple of weeks off that maybe you can add something. So I think that's a good idea. Well, thank to the 65 of you who have, who have stuck around this past 33 minutes, thank you for tuning in. We hope you had a chance to get your questions answered and to learn more things about regular decision and um, how to make your application more competitive. Again, definitely the big summary is take advantage of those op optional opportunities. Make sure you're getting things in on time and that you're looking at your application portals from these schools because again, like every year, students forget things or don't know that they had a missing requirement or this or that. So we don't want you to be in that position um, and organizing yourself and kind of really like having that plan ahead in place. So that way by mid-March, you have as much good news as possible. That's our goal for you. Um, yeah. And hopefully a goal for yourself. But believing yourself is step number one. Uh, yes. Well, and thank you, Renee, for joining. The fact that they came to this webinar, they're much more informed now, so. Awesome. Thank you all so much and enjoy your winter break and holidays and best of luck with those RD apps. Yes. Thanks, y'all. Good luck, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. -bye.